as some of you know, that I'll be going to the Congo in the next, in 10 days, I guess. And I'll be gone for two months. And the first month or so will be in, in seminars for pastors in quite a large area. And then the second uh, month will be, there will be a three-week concentrated course on advanced preaching, uh, no less, <clears throat> at the seminary. And, uh, and so one of the themes of the, the course is expository preaching. And some of you don't even know what that means, right? Uh, but it used to be very common, but now it's not so common. But in expository preaching, you take the passage, a particular passage, and you try and, and expound it and make it so that people understand it. And they can say, oh, that's what he was saying. I got it. And there's a, there's a certain power to expository preaching because it's coming right out of scripture there. Furthermore, it, it forces you to speak about things that you wouldn't or ordinarily speak about. If, if every week you know, I came up with my own subjects, you know, there are some of the difficult things I could leave behind. But if I choose to, to expound and to work through the Gospel of Matthew, for example, from chapter 1 to chapter 28, you know, when I get to a hard passage, you know, I'm forced to deal with it. I'm forced to, to teach it. And, uh, <clears throat> and so there's, there's a real power to, to expository preaching. And it happens to be one of the really big needs in the, in the church in Congo. <clears throat> they, uh, they, do, they have very little expository preaching. And part of the reason is that they have the habit in a, in a local church of of every Sunday a different preacher you know, preaches. And uh, if, if you're the pastor and you preach three or four or five times, then they start murmuring and saying, does he think he's the only one that knows how to preach? OK? <laughs> well, if you don't have that ability to, to give successive teaching, it's very difficult to do expository preaching. Because usually you'd like to take a book of the Bible and start at the beginning and work your way all the way through it. So um, <clears throat> the, what I thought I would do would be to take a passage that fits with what Pastor Ed is doing. And uh, <clears throat> he was actually going to speak about spiritual gifts. And he probably still will. And you'll find that it's not the same thing that you know, I'm talking about, but you know, it's from a different angle. You'll probably give it. <clears throat> but uh, uh, and and this passage is in Ephesians chapter four, verses one to sixteen. And uh, I think that eventually you'll get to look at some of it, and we're going to divide it into about four different sections. And uh, we'll work through it. But uh, <clears throat> before I try and expound this passage, um, I need to give you a little context. Um, I don't know if any of you are, are, are painters, or maybe you have an artistic heart anyway. Okay, And uh, you know that you can have a beautiful painting but if you put a frame around it, the right frame, it makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? You know, it not only focuses your attention, but it often brings out the, the, what the painting is. It's that frame that makes it meaningful in some ways. And, and uh, that's what, before we get into this passage in depth, um, I would like to try and show you the frame you know, of the book of Ephesians and how this passage fits with what Paul is saying. Uh, and I think that you'll see that there's a whole new dimension to spiritual gifts that you weren't even aware of because you never saw it in the frame of what Paul is saying. Okay, so in the book of Ephesians, <clears throat> Paul is writing to to this church at Ephesus, and many people feel like it was a sort of a circular letter to a number of local churches. <clears throat> and uh, he's, it's, it's, it's an area that when you read it in the book of Acts and how Paul evangelized there, there was actually, you know, 
uh, you know, people started destroying their, their idols because of his preaching and that brought economic crisis, you know, and there was a whole riot in the city over this and uh, people also were being converted and uh, there were some guys that wanted to cast out evil spirits and they said, in the name of Jesus, and the Spirit says, yeah, we know about Paul, but we don't know about you know, who you are. And they pounced on him. And uh, you know, all this, you know, they, they brought their magic books. People were being converted, and they brought all their, their occult and their magic books, and they brought them together, and they burned them. And that's the context that he's writing to. <laughs> and he's trying to explain to them what God is, in, in, is doing. And he divides his book into two sections. The first section, he talks about all that God has done for us in Christ. And the, first, the second section, he talks about now as a result of all of that, what kind of people should we be? Okay? And back here, and this is where the frame is in the back in the, in the first three chapters, uh, he starts by a doxology. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And then he goes and spells out some of these blessings. You know, what he says is that in Christ, we already have every spiritual blessing. Uh, and you know, that would make a wonderful sermon too. Uh, but <clears throat> but uh, one of the things he says in this passage, in this uh, in this. Uh, doxology is uh, in verse um, one of the blessings. He talks about different blessings that God you know, has chosen us in Christ to be his adopted children, that he's forgiven us our sins through the redemption of Christ. And then the third blessing that he talks about, he says, and he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will, will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Okay, he made known to us the mystery of his will. You know, what is the mystery of his will? Mystery in the New Testament has the idea of something that was hidden but now is revealed. Okay, he makes known his, this is what was, not known, he's making it known. And, and the big picture is that where is everything going in, in the plan of God? It's uh, to put, let's see, uh, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. So God is in the process and, and one day the ultimate will be when everything is brought in unity under the headship of Jesus Christ. And we all know the need for that. Uh, when, when sin came into the world, uh, the very nature of sin and the efforts of the devil is to, to sow dissension, to sow division, to sow, you know, to, to build barriers between people. And uh, our world is just filled with barriers and we keep creating them. I find that I create them. Uh, you know, how am I different from other people? What makes me better than somebody else, okay? And uh, some of us say, well, you know, I'm better than other people because, uh, because I'm from such and such a race or such and such a tribe. And other people say I'm better than other people because I have more money than other people. And some people say I'm better than other people because I have more money than other people. Huh? And we have a hundred different ways of, of making ourselves better than other people. But Jesus is working in the exact opposite direction. He's working towards unity rather than division. You know, Satan is always sowing the seeds of division. He loves it when people are fighting. You know, when they had this you know, trouble in Paris, you know, he loves that kind of thing. Uh, but God is working through Christ to bring everything in unity under Christ. And uh, maybe you're saying, well, sure seems like it's taking a long time doing it. All right? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, he's already doing it. He's in the process of doing it. And usually we think, well, one day off there in the future when Christ returns, everything will be wonderful and you know, everything will be united under Christ. 
Uh, there will be no more divisions and no more fights and, and so on. Uh, but what about now? Well, God has, there's, there's a stage one in God's plan and stage two. And stage one centers on the church. Um, <clears throat> that God, in his plan, first off, you know, he created Adam and Eve, and then they sinned, they fell, sin came into the human race, and we're in a mess, okay? And uh, so what does God do? God takes the initiative to call Abraham and to bring a nation uh, into being, which brings the Messiah into the world, and through him, he dies and he rises from the dead, and he becomes the beginning of a new nation, of a new society, of a new, of a new tribe of people, totally different. And so God has called us as we become Christians, as we, we submit to Jesus, uh, he, he brings us into the community of, of, of his kingdom, you know, the, the church. And there is the, the, the broader church, but there's also the local expressions of the church. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so, you know, he brings us into the church, and what he's doing is he's starting a new humanity, if you will. You know, it's the humanity of the children of God. And uh, it's, you know, he's, he's in the process of, of doing something totally new, something totally wonderful. And so when he comes, okay, a little bit later, let me just give you a little more background to the framework here. Um, <clears throat> A little bit later, chapter one, he, after the doxology, he has this prayer. And in the prayer, he prays that God will open the minds of their understanding and enlighten them that they might understand. And he cites three things. He says, enlightened in order that you might know the hope to which, you have, to, to which he has called you. In other words, that you might understand all that God had in mind when he called you and the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. So he prays that the Christians there might understand you know, what God had in mind when he called them, and how much power is at their disposition, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, but sandwiched right there in the middle is is a third thing that he would like them to understand. And this is how he expresses it. He says uh, that you might be enlightened uh, and may know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. That we might begin to get a glimpse of the way God sees his people, of the way God sees his church. You know, just a glimpse of it, uh, that, you know, the riches of his uh, inheritance in the saint. Uh, in other words, you know, we usually think of, you know, in Christ, you know, we got an inheritance, you know, and there's a wonderful inheritance that's waiting for us. Uh, and that's true. But Paul says that when God looks at his people, when God looks at the church, he sees us as... Uh, as the riches of his inheritance in the saints. You know, so uh, Pastor Ed has been giving the series on, you know, I love my church, which is good, and it's rich. Uh, and just for this one week, we want to look at, you know, the, the subject of Jesus loves his church. You know, not only does, do, are we to love our church, but Jesus loves his church, and we want to see how, how much he loved his church and what he's doing to make the church uh, what it ought to be. Okay, so that's a, another part of this frame here. Um, and then a little bit later, Paul talks about uh, the, the, this mystery is through the gospel 
the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together in one body. And, and so he goes into, uh, <clears throat> he goes into, uh, <clears throat> The, 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 the whole, a, a whole teaching here, which we can hardly appreciate. But Paul says that God had used, chosen him to be a special agent to reveal his mystery, something that had been hidden before time but was now clear. And his mystery is, this mystery that God revealed, is that, that in Christ, God is uniting both Jews and Gentiles. Now that doesn't seem like a big thing to you, but uh, if if you lived in the in the Jewish nation and if you lived in the Old Testament time, you know that was a big thing. There was a huge difference between us Jews and those you know, Gentiles. And in fact, you know, it was the greatest divide I think, the greatest human divide in history, because. Not only was it there, but God had put it there. God had chosen Abraham and had chosen this nation. And now he had come to the place where he said, from now on, there's no longer Jew and Gentile. You're both one in Christ. And we're going to see this happen in the local church. And we want, to, we want to realize it so that ultimately God wants to, is planning to unite everything under the Lordship of Christ. But in the meantime, he's begun with his people, with the church. And he's called people to himself. And he's planning, he's in the process of developing the church, you know, the people of God, into, into something that's beautiful, into a community of people where there's love and there's forgiveness and there's understanding and there's humility, you know, and... Uh, you're probably saying, you know, I don't know that kind of a church. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, sometimes, not so much, uh, not so much, you know, being at Montclair Community Church. We got a great church, but uh, when when I go to other churches and I see what's what's going on, and even in the Congo. Uh, you know, some of these churches, the problems that they have, you say, whoa, this church is ugly. You know, uh, <laughs> and, and God is in the process of beautifying his church uh, so, that, uh, so that one day, you know, it will, uh, it will be, uh, here's the description, here's the description. And, you know, this passage that... Uh, we often have at weddings, okay? And it talks about the church. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. What a description. You know, he's talking about us. Huh? And this is what he's doing. He's making us into, uh, into a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, uh, but holy and blameless. Now, how is he going to do that? <clears throat> That's where this passage comes in, okay? So now we're going to do the exposition of this passage. <clears throat> And we're going to see how God is in the process of, of making his church, you know, mature and beautiful and, uh, you know, everything he wants it to be. <clears throat> he starts in Ephesians uh, 4, 1 to 16. And I, the problem, you know, we have today is that we have so many different translations and everybody is in the different translation. So that we're... Uh, with this, we're on the same page, okay? And uh, the very first word is missing. You know, it actually says, therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord. 
you know, in other translations you'll see, the therefore. In other words, he said all this in three chapters about what God has done for them. And then he says, therefore, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. And it's sort of like, you know, a seesaw. And right in the middle there is the point of, of balance, right? And, and that's where he is right here. And he's saying, in the light of all that God has done for you, and the better you understand it, uh, then we, we need to live a life that, that fits with that, that, that balances with that, with all that God has done for us. And so the next three chapters, he develops what the Christian life is supposed to be in, in terms of you know, what, what balances out with what God has done. And the first thing that he focuses on is the church and how the church is to function, the community of God's people. Then he goes into other relationships, and he talks about relationships between husband and wife, between uh, employer-employee, between uh, parents and children, and uh, you know, the, the kinds of lives and, and morality that we're to have in the body of Christ. But <clears throat> in this passage, he starts. And let me just read this paragraph for you. And you try and pick out what is the central idea. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And uh, <clears throat> if, you, if you look for the core idea, I would suggest to you that it's, it's verse 3. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. You know, give yourself to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace because this is so important in the body. And before that, he talks about certain qualities of, of character. You know, he says, uh, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. So you can see that, that these are, this is the environment of community. In this kind of environment, a community can flourish when there's a, a spirit of lowliness or humility, of meekness, of bearing one another in love. <clears throat> and you know, those four words we could preach a whole sermon on. But uh, just, just the first one, humility. Now, this is what John Stott says when he, when he comments on this. He says, pride lurks behind all discord while the greatest single secret of concord is humility. <clears throat> if instead of maneuvering for the if instead of maneuvering for the respect of others, which is pride, we give them our respect by recognizing their intrinsic God-given worth, which is humility, we shall be promoting harmony in God's new society. I like that. You know, and and you know, it's these qualities that make the possibility of developing community and unity. Okay, then after he's just finished saying, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit, uh, he says, there is one body, one spirit, one, 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 one. Okay, what's he doing here? He's saying, you guys have a foundation for unity. You have every reason in the world to be one. Because I have given you, and if you're in Christ, you know, all these things we have in common. Look at them. Um, <clears throat> there's <clears throat> one body. It's the body of Christ. We're all in one, the same body, the same body of Christ. One Holy Spirit. Uh, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. Now, we could spend some time trying to figure out what that hope is. I think it's talking about the, the hope of Jesus' return. Uh, we have the same hope. Uh, one Lord, that's Jesus, one faith, 
we could spend some time trying to figure out what he means by that, one faith. Uh, but yeah, I think it's you know, basically a, a faith in Jesus. Uh, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Oh, we could spend a lot of time on that one because uh, there's a lot of different kinds of baptisms, right? You know, I, I think that he's talking about, you know, Paul says elsewhere that we're baptized by one spirit into the, into, into the one body of Christ. So ultimately, you know, our baptism is through the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. So you see, if, if, if we're believers, if we're, if we're followers of Christ, we've got a lot in common. Now, <clears throat> I don't know why I'm so thirsty today, but uh, <clears throat> very often we exaggerate our differences, don't we? Even in the church. We say, oh, you know, he's from that kind of a church. You know, that has that kind of a label. You know, it's Presbyterian or it's Methodist or it's Anglican or it's Catholic or whatever. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so we have all these different labels. And then we say, well, you know, we're not like those people. You know, <clears throat> we, we believe in the Holy Spirit and we can even speak in tongues or, or whatever. Huh? And <laughs> we have all these ways, in, even in the church, of distinguishing ourselves from others as if, as if those were big differences. Those are tiny differences compared with one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one hope. You know, we've got everything in the world in common. Uh, and so that's not the end of the, the question of unity. That's just the foundation for unity. We have a great foundation to, to, to earnestly pursue the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. First off, as we check our attitudes, uh, make sure that we have this humble attitude. And as we realize all that we have in common, now, how do we move on? Okay, this is what Paul says. He says uh, <clears throat> in the second paragraph, verse 7, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, okay, so he's saying, okay, to each one of us, grace has been given. And in the context, as you go along, you realize he's talking about spiritual gifts. To every Christian God has given you know, or Jesus has given a spiritual gift or more. And uh, then he quotes a passage from the Old Testament to, uh, to back up what he said. He says, and he quotes from Psalms, he says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Okay, then he sort of gets bogged down in explaining some things which uh, are really complicated to figure out. Uh, let me just read it. But uh, what does he, in, in parenthesis in the Bible, and I don't know if it's up there or not, they, they removed the parenthesis and they thought that I, it was my idea that was in there, but it was actually the Bible, you know, the parenthesis, okay? <laughs> but this is what the parenthesis says in Ephesians uh, 4, verse 9. What does, what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself, okay, so we'll, we'll just hold there, to fill the whole universe. Okay, uh, now it's really clear, right? <laughs> no, it's really difficult. You know, we could spend a whole half hour trying to figure out you know, why he quoted this verse and what is the relationship between that verse and the exp explanation that he gives and what is the main point that he's saying here. So, you know, we're going to just sort of skip that, okay? You don't you like it when pastors come to the hard pa passages and they say, okay, we're going to skip this. <laughs> <laughs> but basically what he's saying is that in the, in the olden days, even in the Psalms was talking about it, but in the Roman days even more so, uh, a general would go out and he would defeat the enemy and he would bring back to Rome all these slaves and all this booty, all these possessions, and they would this great parade in, in Rome and they would parade all that they had taken from, from, the, from, the, from the foreign country 
and he would, they would often give gifts to people from all this booty. Uh, and, and the picture here is that Jesus descended and now he's ascended. You know, he died, he rose again, he's ascended into heaven, and uh, he's bringing you know, with him all of this, these results. And the, the results, you know, because of this, he, he's giving gifts to his people. Oh, he's giving all these gifts that, that, that we can use uh, for, his, for his glory. <clears throat> okay, so... Uh, that's the first thing. He says, but to each one of us, grace has been given, or you know, gifts have been given, as Christ apportioned it. <clears throat> and then, in verse 11, he says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, and some translations say, you know, and he gave some to be apostles and prophets, and some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to equip his people for work of service so that the body of Christ may be built up <clears throat> until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. <clears throat> okay, so he's saying that, that God chose certain people. He gave them certain gifts, sort of pivotal gifts, of pastor, teacher, evangelist, and their job is to equip Christians to do the work of the ministry. Uh, we, we often have it backwards. You know, we think that you know, it's sort of top down, you know, up at the top, you know, they got everything, and you know, we're just peasants down here at the bottom, just an ordinary person. You know, there's no, no ordinary Christian in the, in, in the church. According to the New Testament, there's no ordinary Christians. Uh, you know, in fact, there's no laity. There's no laity in the church. You know, we are all called to ministry. And uh, God's plan is that, uh, that through these core people, like uh, you know, prophets, teachers, evangelists, um, apostles, and, and we still benefit from what the apostles left us, um, <clears throat> that through these core people, God is, uh, they are equipping the rest of us for ministry. They are helping us discover what is our spiritual gift and how can we use it. You know, there's a huge difference between knowing what your gift is and being at the place where you're effectively using it. Uh, for one thing, and, and many Christians don't even know their gift. And, and there's, there's things that we, we have seminars sometimes to help people begin to identify what their spiritual gifts might be. And there's ways of discovering your spiritual gift. But even if you've discovered it, there's still the, the whole matter of developing in it. You, know, you can have a kid who has a natural ability for music, but that doesn't mean he doesn't have to practice and learn and spend lots of time in, 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 in getting experience and developing his gift. Furthermore, once he's developed it, what is he going to do with it? Where is he going to put it to use? And, and so uh, God wants us to discover our gifts and then develop them and then put them into use. And as we do, what happens? Look what he says. He says, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people uh, in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. Uh, from him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So what do we have here? Paul starts by saying, we already have a foundation for unity. You know, you know, give yourself to, to maintain and, and foster unity in the body of Christ because this is really important. 
That's what I'm all about. I'm about uniting everything under Christ. And the place I'm beginning is with you, uh, with, with the redeemed, with, with believers. And he's teaching us how to be united. And he says, okay, check your attitude. You know, do you have a humble attitude? If you don't, that's going to get in the way of unity. <laughs> okay? And furthermore, he says, look at all these things that we have in common. We got so much in common with other believers, it's pitiful. Uh, and and you know, so we have a foundation for unity. But that's not the end of it. He says, now, let me tell you about diversity of gifts. Now, normally, you'd think that, that diversity doesn't produce unity. But what he's saying is that God has given a diversity of gifts in order to produce a mature, you know, bride of Christ, uh, etc. And uh, it's through that very diversity that we realize a much greater unity, a unity of faith and understanding, where we're not beat around by every new idea that comes into town. And uh, where he says, where the body grows up to, uh, to, to meet the head. You know, Christ the head is fully mature. But we, his body, are far from that. Huh? And God is in the process of developing this body so that it might be you know, effective, that it might match the head. And, and why is this important? In the, in the, in the very beginning of Acts, the, the writer says, uh, Theophilus, the former things in the book of Luke, I wrote to you about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And... Uh, and now I'm going to tell you about what happened later, OK? What, what he continues to do and teach is the implication that he began to do and to teach when he was on Earth. But now, through the apostles in the book of Acts and beyond, he continues to do and to teach. And Jesus is the perfect minister, the perfect servant. And he is capable in all these different areas, but not us. Uh, he gives this person a particular ability to, to evangelize, to, to bring other people. And this one, a particular ability to help people. And this one, a particular ability to see things clearly and with wisdom. And this one, a particular ability to teach and, and develop others. And so through this multiplicity of gifts, God is building up his body into something that's, that's mature and beautiful. You know, and it's in process. And uh, <clears throat> that's sort of the glimpse of what God is, is doing. You know, and and he's, uh, <clears throat> he's working to, uh, to develop a society of people uh, that can be sort of a showcase to the world. You know, Jesus said that when people see your love for one another and see your unity, they'll know that the Father sent the Son into the world. They'll know that this is the true way. Uh, and, and so we realize that we're in process. And, and this picture, which has this wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, frame around it that we saw you know, of, the, of what God is doing and how he sees his church. In fact, <clears throat> there's one passage that, that I skipped over, and it's one of the most wonderful. It says this. It says, in chapter 3, verse 10. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, <clears throat> Jesus, you know, in, in, in the New Testament, when, when the writer wants to talk about the the ultimate demonstration of God's love. He says, look at the cross. At the cross, you can see how much God loves you. If you're ever in doubt, if things are going so bad that you can't even imagine that, this, that God still loves you, look at the cross and you know God loves you. Okay? And then in the New Testament, if you want to know how powerful God is and how much power he has at, at our disposition, for, for, for doing his work. Uh, it says, look at the resurrection. At the resurrection, you see the power of God to break the bonds of death 
and a raised Jesus from the dead far above all principalities and powers. <coughs> and, uh, but in the New Testament, and I would guess that not too many of you have, have noticed this one, but what the writer, what Paul is saying is that the supreme demonstration of the wisdom of God is in the church. That what God is doing in calling out a people and transforming them, making them a society and a demonstration of, of, of his grace, and eventually presenting them as the bride of Christ, that, uh, <clears throat> that that is the supreme demonstration of the wisdom of God. He calls it the manifold wisdom of God, the multi-splendid wisdom of God. And uh, you're probably saying, whoa, the church is that? Uh, <laughs> I thought it was ugly sometimes. <laughs> and I think that what we need is to, to see how God views his church. That he sees us as his treasured possession. And it's not that we've arrived, but he's in the process of making us, you know, a society, a new society of people that honor him, that are totally different from the old way we used to be with division and fighting and all of this. But we're learning how to be united, and by being united and using our gifts, each one for the good of others and for the good of people outside, <coughs> you know, this builds up the body of Christ, and people say, whoa, that church is really wonderful. you got to go there to experience it. And uh, they say, whoa, in that church, ah, people come to Christ just because it's so wonderful. Uh, that's what God wants, okay? So uh, <clears throat> that's how when we talk about, you know, I love my church. Uh, well, Jesus loves his church. But to say Jesus loves his church is, is sort of weak compared with how he views us as his highly valuable treasure. Okay? I like that much better. Okay? <clears throat> so uh, I guess the, the challenge of this pas passage to us is that we're to see unity as a major value in the Christian church that one day everything will be united under Christ. And in the meantime, we should be working in that direction. <clears throat> Secondly, that in order to realize that kind of unity, uh, God has given us a wonderful foundation for unity, but he's also incorporated us into the process where we have to discover and use our gifts in order to realize uh, the the, the wonder of, of what he's doing. You know, and, and Jesus on earth began to do and to teach certain things, and now he continues to do and to teach certain things through his body, the church. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, you know, look at that. Look, look what happened over there. You know, how can you say God loves when that's going on? And what God is saying is, no, you're my body. Get over there and do something about it. Huh? <laughs> anyway, uh, <clears throat> thanks for your patience. Uh, <laughs> let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for the, the wisdom of God demonstrated in the church, a wisdom which you are in the process of displaying to heavenly beings all over. And in pride, you're saying, look at what I'm doing in the world. And uh, we can only see a part of this because we can only see part of the picture. But we believe that, that you're doing something and we want to be a part of it. And we give ourselves to do, do our part, to discover what our gifts are and to, to use them for the full. Jesus gave his whole life for us and we would give our lives for the good of his body. In Jesus' name, amen.